Batman horror host here, a man who found out a nightmare. Professor Mark Edwell, the scientist, led a double life, and the only person who knew it were his assistant, Dr. Laidlaw, and his publishers. But a double life needed not always be a bad one, as his Dr. Laidlaw and the gratified publishers well knew a power of life that this peculiar man, though well, equally good and indifferently produced, would certainly have ended in heaven, somewhere that can be simply contain such a strangely opposite characteristics of this remarkable personality combined. For Mark Elberth, FBR, S, etc., etc., was that unique confirmation hardly ever met in his actual life, a man of mystery and a mystic, as the, as the first, his name stood in the gallery of the great, and the first second, there came the mystery for under the cinnamon of the pilgrim, the author of the brilliant series of the books that appealed to so many, his identity was well concealed, as that of the anonymous writer of weather reports. In the daily newspaper, thousands read its coin open, mystic, stifling little books that issued annually from the pen of the pilgrim, and thousands bore their daily burdens better than having read. While the press generally agreed that the author, besides being an unquenchable princess and optimist, was also a woman, but no one ever succeeded in perpetrating a veil and anonymity and describing the pilgrim and the biologist were one and the same person. Mark Elber, as Dr. Labor knew him, his laboratory was one man, but Mark Elber, as he sometimes knew, saw him after work was another, with rapt eyes and aesthetic little face, discussing the possibilities of union of God and the future human race was quite another. He always held, as you know, he was saying one evening as he sat at his little study behind the laboratory with his assistant and inmate, that vision would play a large part in our life for the awakened man, not to be guarded as infallible, of course, but to be observed and made use of as a guide to post the possibilities. I am aware of peculiar views, sir, the young doctor put in deferrently, yet with certain impatience, for visions come from a region of the consciousness whose was observation of its spirit, and experiment or out of the question, pursued the other with enthusiasm, not associating the interruption, and while they sh- you should be checked out by reason, afterwards you should not be, la- should not be laughed or ignored. All inspiration I hold is the nature of an inferior vision. All our best knowledge has come, much to my confined belief, as a sudden revelation to the brain prepared to receive it. Prepared by hard work, first by concentration, by the possible possible study of all these phenomena, Dr. Laidorf allowed himself to observe, perhaps, sighed the other, but by process nonetheless spiritual illumination. A best match in the world will not light a candle unless the wick be first suitably prepared. If labour was turned to sigh, he knew so well that impossibility to argue with the chief when he was in the regions of the mystic, but at the same time the respect that he felt for his tremendous attainments was so sincere that he always listened with attention and deference, wondering how far the great man would go to what end his cursive combination of logic and emulation would eventually lead him. One last, only last night, continued the older man, a sort of light coming into his rugged features, a vision came unto me again, a one that's haunted me at the intervals ever since my youth, I will not be, will not be denied, the little lord fidgeted in his chair, all oh, about the tablets of the gods, you mean, and the lies somewhere hidden in the sands, he said patiently, a sudden gleam of interest came in his face as he turned to catch the professor's reply, and what, and that, and that I am to be the one to find them, to decipher them, and give the great knowledge to the world. Who will not? Who will not believe? Laughed Laylor shortly, and interested in spite of his vainly veiled contempt, because one even the keenest minds, in the keenest minds in the right sense of the world, are hopelessly unscientifically, replied the other gentle. His face. 
closely aglow with the memory of his vision, yet it is more likely he continued for a moment plills, peering into the space of raptured eyes, with saw things too wondrous for exact language to describe, then the near should be given unto man in the first sign ages of the world, some record of purposes and problems that was set upon to solve, in a word he cried, fixing his shining eyes upon the face of his perplexed assistant, that God messages in the far off world ages should have given to this creature some full statement to the secret of the world, of the secret of the soul, of the meaning of life and death, the explanation of being here, to the great end we are destined in the ultimate fulfillment of things. Dr. Layla was such speechless. Those are those these outbursts of mystical exfusism had he witnessed before with only one man other man you'd ever listen to, to a single sentence but not but to Professor Igor, man of knowledge and profound investigator. He listened with respect because he regarded his position as temporary and pathological, in some sense a reaction for the intense strain for a long mental concentration of many days. He smiled with, some, with something between sympathy and resignation. He did make the other weapons gaze. Do you have, but you have said, sir, and, and many times that you consider the ultimate secrets to be screened. Screen from us all, pos- all poss- poss- possible. The ultimate secrets, yes, can they be preserved by, but they lie buried beneath an undestructible record of the secret meaning of life, originally known to man the days of a pristine innocence. I am convinced by this strange vision, so often vanquished faith to me. I am equally sure that one day it shall be given to me to announce to a very well this glorious and terrific message. He continued to a great length in the glowing language to describe the species of the vivid dream that come to him revealed to rules since his earliest childhood, showing in detail how he discovered those very tablets of the gods and proclaimed their splendid contents whose precise nature was always, however, withheld from him the vision as sick, a patient and suffering humanity. A sculptor just, sir, well described pilgrim at the Apostle Hope, said the young doctor gently when he had finished. Now, if that rule could speak, hear you speak, and we realize from that strange depths came your simple faith. Professor holding his hands and smile, a little, little child broke from his face like sunshine in the morning. Half the good, half the good book, good my books, could do, would be instantly destroyed, he said sadly. They would say that I wrote it with my tongue in my cheek. But wait, he added so significantly. Wait till I find these tablets of the gods. Wait till I've told the solutions of the old world problems in my hands. Wait till the light of this new revolution breaks upon a confused humanity. It wakes to find its bravest hopes justified. Oh, then, my dear Laylor, he broke off suddenly, but the doctor, carefully guessing the fault in his mind, caught up with him immediately. Perhaps this very summer, he said, t- trying hard to t- take the suggestion. Make sure to keep pace with honesty. Your explanations in Australia, but you're digging in the remote civilization of what once Calidia. You may find what you dream of. The professor held up his hand. A smile with a fine old face. Perhaps, he murmured, perhaps. Softly, perhaps. When the young doctor think, thanking the gods of sciences for leaders of preparations, ab, ab, well, so harmless a character, went home strong in his centitude, knowledge of externals, proud that he was able to refer to visions of self suggestion, and wondering compensantly whether it was his old age he might not suffer, us all suffer himself, visitations of very kind, afflicted with respect chief. He got he got into bed and thought again of his master's rugged face, a funny shaped head, deep lines traced by years of work, and self discipline. He turned over on his pillow and fell asleep with a sigh, with half a wonder, half a regret. It was in February nine months later when Doctor Laidlaw made his way to Charing Cross to meet his chief, after his long absence of travel and exploration, a vision about the so-called tablets of the gods. And meanwhile passed almost entirely from his memory. 
There's a few people on the train, the stream, the traffic, without running any other way. He had no difficulty in finding the man he had come to meet. A shock of white hair beneath the low crowned felt hat felt was already enough to see with him uh, uh, easy. Here I am at last, exclaimed the professor, somewhat wearily, clasping uh, his friend's hand at this. He listened to the young doctor's warm greetings and questions. Here I am, a little older and much dirtier than I when you last saw me. He glanced down laughingly at his travel stained garments. A much wiser, said Laylor, with a smile as he bursted from the pavement. The porters gave his chief the latest scientific news. At last it came down to practical considerations. And your luggage, where is that now? You must have tons of it, I suppose, said Laylor. Hardly anything, Professor Abel answered. Nothing, in fact, what, but what you what, but what you see. Nothing but this handbag. Laughed the other, thinking of joking. A small apartment in the van. Was a quiet reply. I have no other luggage. You have no other luggage. Repeated Laylor, turning sharply to see if he were, uh, were in earnest. You should. Why should I need more? The professor added simply. Something in the man's face or voice and manner. The doctor hardly knew which. Suddenly struck him as strange. There was a change in him, a change of so profound. So little the surface at first he had to come aware of it. For a moment, it was so an utterly alien personality stood there before him, a noisy, bustling throng. Hearing on the homely, friendly turmoil of a clearing across the crowd, a curious feeling of cold passed over his heart, touching his hair with icy fingers, so he actually trembled and felt afraid. He looked up quickly to his friend, his mind working with a startled and unwelcome thoughts. Only this, he repeated, indicating the bad. But that's all the stuff you went with. And have you brought nothing home? No treasures? This is all I have, he never said briefly. Pale smile that went for words caused the doctor a second indescribable sensation of uneasiness. Something was very, very wrong. Something was very queer. He wondered how he had not noticed it sooner. Arrest of sorrows, of course. By slow fate, he said, added tactfully, as naturally as possible. But come, sir, you must be tired and wander to food after your long journey. I had got a taxi once. You must see what about the other's luggage afterwards. He seemed to me he hardly knew quite what he was saying, and the change his friend came upon him so suddenly not to grow up grew upon him more and more distressingly yet he should, could not make out exactly what he it considered. It consisted. A terrible suspicion began to take shape in his mind, troubling him dreadfully. I am neither very tired nor need of food. Thank you, Professor, quietly. So quietly. And this is all I have. This is no luggage to follow. I have brought home nothing. Nothing but you, but what you see. His words conveyed finality. And he took got in the taxi, tipped the porter, who had a staring in amazement at a vulnerable figure of the scientist, and would convey slowly and noisily to the house in the north of London, where a laboratory was a scene, the whole of their product labours of years, the whole way, way the, the professor Lombard, Ember, we regretted no, utter no word, not even Dr. Labour, took the Find, could find the camera to ask a single question. It's only late last night that before he took the departure. As the two men were standing for the fire at study, a study where they had discussed uh, so many problems of vow, absorbing dis- interest, vital and in- absorbing interest, what day Dr. Lane had found strength to come to the point with the same qu- different questions. The professor had been giving him a superficial and desultory account of his travels. His journey by camel, his encampments among the mountains, in the desert, of his observations among the buried temples, and deeper into the waste of the prehistoric sands. But suddenly the doctor came to a desired this point from the, a kind of nervous rush, almost like a frightened boy. And you, and you found, he said, you began staring looking hard at the other's dreadfully altered face, which line of hope and cheerful as white seemed to have obliterated as a sponge wipes, marking the slate you found. I found, replied the other in a solemn voice, it was a voice of a mystic rather than a man of science. I found what I went to seek. A vision never felt, once fell me. It led me straight to the place, like a place in the stars. 
Like a star in the heavens, I found the tablets of the gods. Dr. Lilo caught his breath and steadied himself on the back of his chair. The words felt like particles of ice upon his heart. For the first time, his professor uttered a well-known phrase about the glow of light and wondered if his face had always accomplished it. You have brought them? he fathered. I have brought them home, said the other, in a voice of a ring like oh, iron. I have them, I have them deciphered, I have, I have deciphered them. Profound despair with a boom, boom of, 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 of outer darkness, the spare, deep sound of hopeless soul freezing in the outer spare cold of space, seemed to fill the pauses between the s- s- brief sentences. A silence followed, during which Dr. Laylock saw nothing but a white face before him, utterly fade and return. It was like the face of a dead man. They are. Alas, it's just structable, he heard a voice that could continue its evil metallic ring. Indestructible, they all repeated mechanically, hardly knowing what he was saying. Again, a, a silence of several minutes passed, during which a creepy cowl about his heart. He stood and stared at the eyes of the man he had known for two loved so long. I had worshipped too, the man who first opened his own eyes, who were when they were blind, and led him to the gates of knowledge, and no little distance along the diff- path and path beyond. A man who in another direction had passed on the strength of his faith into the hearts of thousands of his books. I see, I may see them, he asked for at last. In a low voice, he hardly recognised his own. You will let me know their messages. Their message. Professor Abel kept his eyes fixedly upon his assistant's face as he answered with a smile that looked more than a grin of death than a living hu- human life smell. When I'm gone, he whispered, when I have passed away, I shall find them. I'll read the translation I made, and to which your time you will tie the latest sources of science as you suppose will aid you to prompt us their utter destruction. He uttered a moment, and his face grew pale as the face of a corpse. It's all that time, he added presently, uh, looking up. I must ask you not to refer to the subject again, and keep my confidence. Meanwhile, absolutely. A year passed slowly by, and by the end of it, Dr. Laidlaw had found it necessary to sever his working compassion with his friend and one-time leader. Professor Albert was no longer the same man. Light had gone out of his life. The laboratory was closed. He no longer put pen to paper or supplied his mind to a single problem. In a short space of a few months, he passed from a hell and hearty to a late middle age to the edge of old age. A man collapsed on the edge of delusion death. It was plain, lay waiting for him in the shadows of every day, any day. He knew it to describe faithfully the nature of his profound alteration. His character and temperament is not easy, but they Lord had summed it up for himself. Free he was, last of the hope. The splendid mental powers remained indeed endemmed, but the incentive to use them, to use them for help of others had gone. The character had held his fine and unanxious um, selfish habits of years, but the fell far goal to which they had been the leading strings had faded away. Desire for knowledge, knowledge for its own sake, had died. A passionate hope which for Pivero had emanated with tireless energy, a heart and brain of splendidly equipped and intelligent, with suffocated a total eclipse, the, to- the central fires had gone out. Nothing was worth doing, thinking, working for. There was nothing to work for any longer. At first, his first step was to recall as many of his books as possible. His second was to close the laboratory and stop all research. He gave no explanation. He invited no questions. His whole personality crumbled away, as to speak, so to speak, till his day life became a mere mechanical process of coping the body, feeding the body, keeping in good health, to avoid physical discomfort, and above all, doing nothing that would interfere with sleep. The professor did everything he could to lengthen the hours of sleep, therefore to go therefore for forgetfulness. It was clear enough to Dr. Laylor, a weaker man we knew would be sought to lose himself in one form or another, or sexual indulgence, sleeping draughts, drink, in the first pleasures that came to hand, self distraction would have been the method of a little little type older type, deliberated evil doing poisoning his awful knowledge. All he could, the means of a still another what kind of man. Mark Eber 
For none of these, he held himself under applying control. Her facing silently, without complaining the terrible facts, he honestly believed himself to have a fortune enough to discover. Even to his friend and insistent Dr. Laylar, he felt safe to no word or true explanation of Lamarant. He went straight forward to the end, knowing well the end was not very far away, the death of coming very quietly one day to him. As he was sitting in the armchair, the study was directly facing the doors. Laboratory, the doors that no longer opened. Not a lady by happy chances to have was with him at a time, just able to reach his hide in response to sudden painful efforts of breath, just in time too to catch the unmurmured words that fell upon the planted lips, like a message from the other side of the grave. Read them you must, and if so, if you can destroy but the voice sunk to low. A doctor later only just caught the dying syllables, but never, never give them to the world. Like a grey bundle of dust loosely covered up by in an old garment, the professor sank back into his chair and inspired. But this is only in the death of the body. His spirit had died two years before. The estate of the dead man was small and uncomplicated. That Dr. Laidlaw, as so it to creature, and virtually neglected it. Never just been setting up. A month after the funeral, he sat alone in his upstairs library, the last sad duties completed. His mind full of prodigal memories of regrets of loss of his friend, he revered and loved, to whom his debt was so incredibly great. In the last two years, indeed, had made him been for him terrible to watch his swift decay the greatest combination of heart and brain had ever known to realize he was powerless to help with a source of profound grief to him it remained the end of his days at the same time his insatiable curiosity possessed him a study of dementia was of course outside his pro- special province as a specialist but he knew enough to be understand how small a matter might be the actual cause of how many how many great illusion had been devoured with many very beginning of ceaseless and increasing anxiety, no, what the professor meant, found in the sands of Colonia, what was the precious stones of God might be, and particularly what was the real cause that slapped the man's sanity and hope, and what inscription was that he was believed to have deciphered upon it, therefore. The curiously feature of all, all in his own mind was whereabouts his friend had dreamed of finding a message, glorious hope and comfort, he had apparently found, so far, I have found anything intelligible at all. Not invented the whole thing in the dementia. The secret of the world, the meaning of life and death, was so terrible. It should rob the heart of courage, the soul of hope. When you, when, what then? Could be the contents of light, little brown parcel. Professor, a quick to him. He's dying, he's a hundred dying sentences. Actually, his hand was trembling as he turned to a waiting table and began slowly to unfasten a small, old-fashioned desk to which a small gift in... Initials M.E. stood forth as a melancholy Melento. He put the key into the lock and turned, half turned it. Then suddenly he stopped. He looked about him. Was it fa- was that sound at the back of the room? It was just as so, though someone laughed. Then he turned the smooth at the sound. The cough. A slight shudder. A slight shudder can, can, ran over him and stood at st- listening. This is absurd, he said aloud, too absurd for belief. This I should be so nervous. It's the effect of curiosity, but unduly prolonged. He smiled a little sadly, and his eyes wandered. In the blue summer sky, as the plain trees are swaying, and the wind blows his phone door. It's a reaction, he continued. The curiosity of two years to be quenched in a single moment, and this attention or close must be considerable. He turned his back to the brown desk and opened it without delay. His hand was as firm now. He took the, uh, the paper parcel and laid it in, uh, in, uh, inside without a tremor. It was heavy. A month later, there lay on the table for him a couple of rebel worn placards of grey stone. They looked like stone, although they felt like metal, of which he saw markings of curious names, character. He might have been the mere traces of the natural forces. Uh, the ages are, are equally well, and half of the illiterate hieroglyphics cut upon the surface in the past centuries by some or less an untortured hand of a common scribe. He lifted each stone in turn and examined it carefully. It seemed to him that a great faint flow of heart passed. A substance in his skin, he put them down again, suddenly, as with a gesture of uneasiness. A very clever, almost a very imaginative man, he said to himself. Who could squeeze the secret's life and death 
with, from such broken lines as these. As those. Then he turned to a yellow envelope lying up beside them. The text with a single word on the outside, a writing of the reverse of the word translation. Now, he thought, taking it up with a sudden violence to conceal his nervousness. Now for the great solution. Now to earn the meaning of the words. Why man can is made and why his disciple is worth why. Wow. Wow. And his self is a plain, true light, light, law of advancement. There was a shadow of sneer in his voice, yet something in him shivered at the same time. He held the emblem as though weighing it up in his mind, and his mind pondering on many things, then curiously won the day. He suddenly tore it open with the gesture of an actor who tears open a letter on the stage, knowing there's no real writing inside of it all. A page of finely written script on the late professor's handwriting lay before him. He read it low with from beginning to end, missing no word, uttering every each syllable distinctly upon it under his breath as he read. A part of his face grew ghastly. As he neared the end, he began to shake all the while over with a glue. His breath came heavily in grass. He still gripped the sheet of paper, having deliberately, as by the intense effort of will, read it through a second time from beginning to end, and this time the last syllable dropped from his lips. The whole face of his man flamed with a sudden and terrible anger. His skin became deep, deep, deep red. He clenched his teeth. With all his strength and his, his vigorous soul, he was struggling to keep himself un- control himself. For perhaps five minutes he stood there beside the table without stirring a muscle. He must have been carved out of stone. His eyes were shut, and his head and his chest betrayed the fact that he was a living being. Then, with a strange quietness, he lit a match and applied to the sheet of paper. He held his hand. The ashes fell slowly from him, piece by piece. He blew them from the window sill into the air, his eyes following them as they floated away. The summer that breathed so warmly under the under the world. He turned back slowly in, in, into the room. Although his actions and movements were absolutely steady and controlled, it was clear that he was on the edge of a violent action. The hurricane might have burst upon the still room at any moment. His muscles were tense and rigid, and suddenly he brightened, collapsed, and sank backward in the chair like a tumbled bundle of inert matter. He had fainted in less than half an hour. He recovered consciousness and sat up. And before he made no sound, but a syllable passed his lips. He rose quietly. I looked about, looked about the room. Then he did a curious thing. Taking a heavy stick from the rack in the corner, he approached the mouthpiece with a heavy, shattering blow. He smashed the clock to pieces. The clock f- fell in shivering animisms. See, seize your li- lying voice forever, he said in a cursing, cursing still, even tone. There's no such thing as time. He took the watch from his watch pocket, smashed it against round several times along by the long gold chain, smashed it to submarines against the wall in a single blow, then walked into his laboratory next door, hung it to his broken body on the bones of a skeleton in a corner of the room. One damn mockery hang above, above another, he said, and it's one of the two delusions, both of you, a small core of farce. As false. He moved, he moved back to the front room. He st- stood opposite the bookcase, which stood in the row of strictures of the world. Tracy behind him, squishy printed, a late professor's most treasured position. Next to him, several books signed the program. One by one, he looked at them from the shelf and held them through the open window. A dream, double dream, double dream, foolish dreams, he cried. With a vicious laugh. Presently he stopped with a sheer exhaustion. He turned his eyes slowly to the wall opposite, where, being a weird array of west eastern swords and daggers, swords and sword, spears and collection of many journeys, he crossed the room and went on his finger along the edge. His mind seemed to waver. No, he muttered presently. Not that way. There are easy, better ways than that. He took his hat and passed downstairs into the street. It was five o'clock, and June's sun lay hot upon the pavement. He felt a wet door not burn the palm of his hand. Ah, Laidlaw, this is well meant, cried a voice at his elbow. It was an actor coming to see you. 
I case so well interested you. Besides, I remembered you, my Lord, that you favour tea with orange leaves, I admit. Is Alex uh, Stephen, the great doctor? I have had no tear today, Leo said in a dozen days' manner, after staring for a moment as though the other had struck him in the by the face. A new idea entered his mind. What's the matter? asked he. Dr. Stephen quickly. Something's wrong with you. Is this uh, sudden heat or overwork? Come, man, let me go inside. A broken light, sudden, a sudden light broke upon his face. The younger man, the light of a sudden incident, inspiration, he looked at his friend's face and held, told a direct lie. Odd, he said. I myself was just coming to see you. I was something of great importance to set your confidence with. But in t- your house, please, as Stephen urged him towards his own door. It's your in in your house. Only room. It's the only room. It's the only room in the corner, and I cannot go back there to my rooms. Till I told you. It's your. I'm your patient for the moment. He added, just stumbling as soon as they were seated in the privacy of the hypnosis centrum. Oh, what? Wait. I want. I want. Uh, Doctor. But dear Leila, he ran to the other, in a soothing voice of command, which suggested that many a suffering soul to cure its pain lay in the power of its own reawakened will. I am always at your service, you know. You are all to tell me what I can do for you. I will help you. Help if I can do it, and I will do it. He closed, showed his very every desire to help him out. His manner was indescribably tactful and deceit, direct. Dr. Leila shook uh, uh, up. Into his face. I remember surrender my will to you, he said. Already claim the other's healing presence. I want you to treat me hypnotically at once. I want you to suggest to me, his voice seemed to become very tense, that, uh, that I should forget, should forget I don't die. Everything that has occurred to me during the last two hours until I must die, until I die in mind, he said the solemn emphasis, till I die. He flundered and stumbled like a fo- frightened boy. Alex and Stephen looked at him vexedly without speaking. And further, Laidlaw continued, I want you to ask me no questions. I wish to forget even ever for everything. Forever something I've only recently discovered, something that's so terrible and so yet obvious. I hardly understand why not the patient in the, why is not patent to every mind in the world? For I have always had a moment of absolute clear vision or merciless of my errors. I want no one in the world to know what it is, at least not at all my friend yourself. He talked in an utter confusion, hardly knew what he was saying, but a pain on his voice and a f- anguish his voice, pain on his vi- face and anguish his voice that made the instant possible to others' heart. Nothing is easy, said Dr. Stephen. After hesitation and so sight, the other, prob- the other probably did man- or it, uh, even notice it. Come into my room, when we shall not be disturbed. I can heal you of memory of at least twenty hours. We will be wiped out as though it had never been. You trust me, absolutely? I know I can, Leila said simply. He followed him. Now later they passed back into the front room again. Some was already behind the houses, opposite the eight shadows. Gun together. I went off easily, Leila asked. You were a little obstinate at first, but though you come in like a lion, you went on like a lamb. I let you sleep a bit afterwards. Dr. Stephen kept his eyes sunny, rather steady upon his friend's face. What were you doing in the fire before they came here? He asked, posing in a casual tone as he lit a cigarette and handed us a case to his patient. I let you, let me, I, let me see. Oh, I know, I was worrying about my my way for poor old Edgar's papers and things. He's executed, you know. Then I weary and came out for a whiff of air. He spoke lightly and with perfect naturalness. Obviously, he was telling the truth. I prefer specimens of papers. He could laugh queerly. I know, said Professor Dr. Stephen. Holding a lighted match to a cigarette, his face wore an expression of content and the experiment had been a great success. I remember the last two hours and wiped away utterly, laid on all the chatting gangly and easy about a dozen other things that interest him. Together they went out in the street and at the door, Dr. Stephen, de- that human of a joke, a worry smile, worry fi- wry face that made his friend laugh heartily. Don't dine on the breakfast old papers, won't he? He cried as he vanished down the street. 
Followed, he all went up to his study to the top of the house. Halfway down, he met his housekeeper, Dr. Mrs. Fallings. She was flustered and sighting her, her, her face was red and perspiring. There have been burglars here, she cried, sighting or something funny. All our things, it's just... It, it, it's all the things, it's just anyhow, sir. I found everything all about every, everywhere, she said. Very really confused, it's only an upper precise but servant. It's unusual to find a thing out of the place. Oh, my specimens, cried the doctor, bashing up the stairs at thought such speed. Have you been to, have you been touched or through to doctor's laboratory? Mrs. Fairley painted a heavily behind him. My laboratory isn't touched, she explained. You see, but he smashed the library clock and they bring you gold watch, sir. And it's gun in his hands. The wind dots of books were no value. You lay flung out the window, just like so much rubbish. They have been... They must have been well drunk, Dr. Ladle, sir. Young scientists made a hurried expression to, of the um, emanation of the rooms. Nothing of value was missing. He began to wonder what kind of robbery workers they were. He looked up sharply at Mrs. Fulton standing in the doorway. For instance, he seemed to cast about, about in his mind for something. Odd, he said, Lip. I only left here an hour ago. Anything was all right then. What was it, sir? Yes, sir. She glanced sharply at him. Her, a room built upon the courtyard. He must have seen the books come crashing down and heard her master leave the house a few minutes later. And what's that rubbish the brutes will have left? Cried looking, taking up two slabs of warm grey stone on the writing table. Brick, bar brick or something? I do declare. He looked very sharply again at the confused and troubled, master, uh, troubled, troubled housekeeper. Throw them under the dust heap, Mr. Follies, and let me know if there's anything is missing in the house. I will notify the police this evening. When she left her room, he went into the laboratory, he took his watch to off the scanner's fingers. His face wore a troubled expression, but after a moment's late thought, it cleared, cleared again. His memory was a complete blank. I suppose I left it on the writing table when I, was, when I went out to take the air. He said there was no one at the present to contradict him. He crossed the window, blew carefully some ash or burnt paper from the steel, and stood watching him as he floated away lazily upon the tops of trees.